and it hits me, oh my gosh, this is that triangle. You know, there's explanation for everything that occurred in the Rendlesham Forest incident that doesn't involve aliens at all. It was completely silent. It comes right over our heads. He saw a classic flying saucer really standing in the clearing. He turned over to my father and held his hand and he looked in his eyes and he said, we're not alone. Welcome to Podcast UFO for our live show. We're live every Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on podcastufo.com. During the show, feel free to participate live in our chat room. And don't forget to like us on our very active Facebook page. And welcome to the show. I'm Martin Willis, your host, and our guest this evening is Connie Willis. Uh, No relation to me, Martin Willis. But uh, she's been in broadcast radio, TV, and the film industry for over 20 years. You may have seen her uh, reporting or hosting, anchoring on ESPN or Speed or UPN or Disney, Oxygen, uh, or she may be pitching products and infomercials. Um, She's a great conversationalist. She's into paranormal and other topics. We're going to be talking UFOs. We may go off that subject a little bit this evening, so fair warning to you diehard UFO fans. We may be skipping around a little bit tonight. But before our guest, we have the great, the one and only, and very busy Alejandro Rojas coming up with the UFO news. And uh, just a quick mention, I'm sure you've heard it before, but if you haven't, we're running live right here on podcastufo.com every Wednesday at 8 p.m., Eastern Standard Time. We're still on the Dark Matter Digital Network, and we're on there Thursday evenings from 9 to 11 p.m. Uh, that network is going strong, and Heather Wade is going strong in Art Bell's seat and uh, getting a lot of great guests. So from what I understand, that uh, her audience is growing all the time, so check that out. And uh, we're going to try to take some calls this evening, so if you want to call in, And remember, you can always listen live for free to the whole show right here at podcastufo.com. And let's bring in the busy guy, Alejandro. How are you doing? Busy. (laughs) I I know. I'm doing well, though. Yeah. Um, I'm very excited. Very excited to see you um, and everyone else. That's right, and we'll all be rolling in pretty quickly. Yeah, I mean, it's just a few short days away, so there's lots of loose ends. Uh, Now it seems like I'm just really busy with people contacting, needing details and stuff. Uh, But lots of media attention as well. Uh, Maybe people saw it. If not, you could check out, you know, the Open Mind UFO uh, Facebook group or or Twitter or whatever. But um, we, uh, we were featured on MSN. Wow. So listeners out there, if you are a first time listener or you haven't been listening for a while, we are talking about the UFO Congress that's going on in Phoenix, Arizona next week, starting February 17th and Wednesday. I'll be doing a live show from there. So far, I have uh, Ben Hansen, Chase Klitsky. Oh, God, I can't remember all the others. Uh, A number of them, perhaps uh, Stan Friedman and a number of other people will be joining us. It should be a great. Oh, yeah. Sam Maranto. Um, he'll be joining us as well. So uh, next week it'll be great. And I cannot wait for this. You have so many awesome speakers. And I'll be working the soundboard. So if you're looking for to meet up with me, I will not be running the camera. I'll be the sound guy, right, for a few mornings. Yeah, so people will be, if they can't hear very well, they'll be saying, turn it up or turn it down. Right. And I'm going to, I'll probably wear a UFO cap, Exeter UFO okay, cap. Okay, good so idea. People can uh, uh, know that it's me. And maybe I'll put a great big cool. smiley face alien name tag on or something. That's a great idea. Yeah, figure something out. So, what's uh, besides you being crazy busy getting ready, what else is going on? Any Have you been able to look at any UFO reports? Well, um, we do have a couple that have been posted on the site, um, but, you know, one piece of news that I'd like to share with everyone is that uh, Bob Dean's not dead. Bob Dean's not dead. 
So you haven't heard this. No. So there are rumors and everything going around that Robert Dean, um, he uh, was a master sergeant. He says that, uh, you know, he had seen essentially some UFO files that didn't get out to the public. And um, and he's been uh, – he comes to the conference often. He lives in Tucson. There are rumors that he passed away. And then um, a researcher – went on the air last night and said he had, or the night before, and, and it's not true. He has not passed away. Uh, he actually lives in, in this area now, and uh, many people have uh, contacted his wife to confirm that he has not passed away. So <laughs> That must um, be a great feeling for him. <laughs> yeah, huh? I can't remember. There was a celebrity. There was rumors going around, and uh, he... He said, you know, I'm, I'm quite alive here or something like that. Mark Twain said, the rumors of my death have been greatly exaggerated. <laughs> All right. Well, a couple of sightings, though, from this last week posted by Roger Marsh, who uh, is a director of communications for the Mutual UFO Network. And he, he posts uh, UFO sightings from MUFON on, on our website. Probably the most exciting and controversial is one from the Spokane Valley in Washington. This was actually a video taken January 26, 2014, where you see this light that is kind of blinking and uh, an object drops out of it which is kind of interesting. Um, James Clarkson is the Washington State Director out there. He spoke at the UFO Congress last year. He's a great investigator, great guy. I'm a big fan. They did quite a bit of research. Uh, he worked with a scientist on this um, who worked for NOAA, and uh, they are looking for radar data, but um, they kind of did a lot of investigation, and, and they feel that this is an unknown object. So... Uh, they are not sure what the heck it was. Um, so it's kind of an interesting video. There's a few people who believe that it's a, it's a Chinese lantern and it's a, a flame, like it's a, a piece of the lantern falling from the Chinese lantern. And that's what you see. I'm not so sure about that. The witness testimony wouldn't match up with that, but, uh, it's a really neat sighting. It's a very interesting video. Right. And it's the second time. If you look, if you watch the video and you can get to that in our show notes or over at openminds.tv, if you check out that video, you'll hear um, the excitement that these people are talking in the background who are filming it. Also, there's an account of it zigzagging, you know, and the, the wind was calm that night and all that. And if that account was true and this was the second time they'd seen this, then, yes, it is uh, quite an interesting sight. Yeah, so it's kind of cool. I definitely encourage people to check it out. And you got one other, huh? Yeah, another one, uh, which came with an interesting drawing, and uh, and it's from Alaska, a, a witness who saw something in uh, Old Harbor, uh, above Old Harbor in Alaska. This sighting was January 14th, 2016 at 8.15 p.m., and you see the object, it almost looks like a cruise ship in the sky or something. Let me just read you what... Um, the witness had said mm -hmm. the, uh, the witness was going to the gym to pick up her daughter. She says, as I rounded the corner by the culvert, I thought I saw a shooting star off to my right towards the hillside. As I got to the store uh, boat harbor area, I realized it was three blinking lights close together. I thought maybe it was a remote control airplane or a drone because it was really dark out, too late for planes to fly in, too close to the hillside. Um, when they got to the school, they could, she saw that her girls were swinging, um, and her daughter came running to her at full speed saying excitedly, did you see that mom? It was a big drone or something right above us. It hovered right above us. Mm. So she says the object was traveling too really fast and it took a sharp, sharp left turn, uh, and it headed towards a, a nearby airstrip. But, uh, yeah, she thought this thing was pretty strange. I wonder if it could have been a drone. I guess it's it's still possible, um, this multi-layered thing. I mean, mm. uh, I, yeah, I, I'm sure it's possible. I mean, drones can do some pretty, you know, drastic maneuvers. Right. So I suppose it's possible. And they can hit like 60 miles an hour, which, if they're close, looks pretty fast. You know, yeah. That still, could, uh -huh. it's awful hard to say. There's, Alaska has always intrigued me because it seems like there's a lot going on there, and there's so much vast openness there. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, this one, the daughter said she felt that the object was eight feet above her and that it hovered there for a few minutes. Um, she said she estimated the size of the object to be about the size of a hood of a truck. Oh. So it, it'd be pretty big. She thought it was some kind of drone tracking her. Yeah, what but, about uh, sound? Did they talk about any sound? Let me look. Please hold. Yeah, sure. Do, 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 da, da, da. Did he do when I used to uh do the show i uh early on, I would call the guest after I did the news, and uh, often while the the phone was ringing and stuff, I would do that music that was my calling music <laughs> do 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 da, 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 da. but I did find your answer. she did say it sounded she heard a buzzing no- noise almost like a blow dryer mm, so it very very well could have been a drone. Yeah, because a drone would sound similar to that. So that's uh, Under Investigation by Alaska MUFON. Well, thanks so much, Alejandro, and we'll be seeing you in just a couple of days. Yeah, really exciting. So we'll see you soon. Everybody should keep an eye to the media, too, because we're going to have Fox News is going to be there. Uh, There's going to be some other media, so uh, we should have some good media coverage of the UFO Congress, and uh, we usually get pretty good coverage because I direct them um, to what I want them to see, and uh, so we'll see how that goes. Excellent. All right, everyone, hang in there for the quick music break, and we'll be right back with Connie Willis. Connie. Hey. Welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much. This is uh, great. I I was posting it as the Willis and Willis show. I hope you're okay with that. (laughs) I'm okay. How often can I do that, you know? That's right. (laughs) I guess we Willis squared. Well, (laughs) (laughs) set the record. We're not related that we know of, but you... That we know of. Yeah, but we both have roots in England as far as we know. Absolutely. That's where, it, you know, I think in England, we're like supposed to be a Smith or a Johnson over there. Very yeah, common. We're everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. So you have a very interesting background. And the fact that you're actually into um, the topics that we explore here makes it even better. Um, you want to tell the listening audience basically your background and also you can. Um, Tell us a little bit about how you got interested in the paranormal aspect of things, along with UFOs and abductions and all that other stuff. Right. It's funny. You know, um, the only people that really say paranormal, and that includes everything, you know, is uh, TV people. <laughs> uh, and so because when you're in TV, you got to say paranormal. Right. You know, they don't uh, they don't understand that pretty much uh, UFO is, you know, people – we don't really put it in the paranormal, but they do. So they just put it all under one word. So you kind of got to do that. But, um, um, you know, um, let's see, I was going to do a Steve Martin line, but I don't know if I can do that one anymore, but, uh, it was funny when he did it, but you know, I don't know. I've, I've been in the uh, paranormal, uh, all my life, just, uh, not out of choice, just because it came to me, uh, from my earliest memories, but also from my earliest memories, I was going to be in TV and radio. That's just the way it was. It was really just film and TV. Radio was never on the list where radio ended up being one of the top things in my life where it was funny, uh, going to the university of Kentucky, I had to take some radio classes and I was like, Oh, I don't want radio, you know, film and TV. That's it. I don't want radio, but radio was like number three on the list. And I remember my professor, Professor Clay Gauntz was his name. I, I I love. I ended up loving him so much that I, if I ever had a child, I wanted to let name it Clay just because of this guy. He looked like um, uh, George Carlin, uh. and he he would try to be. You know, you look at him and, and try to be serious, but he had said one one day when I said oh, I don't really want to do radio, he was like, "You're going to find out that that's going to be your best foundation." And he's correct, mm. and you could probably vouch for that because you're live. You're always live. 
and you just have to get through it. You have to do it. And if you fall down, you know, you, you pick yourself up and you keep on going. You don't sit there and worry about it or you don't say, cut, you know, do over, which uh, can drive you nuts for sure. But I always knew I wanted to do TV, radio, in the media of some uh, in some way. But I knew uh, when I started interning uh, for news stations, I was like, no, no, no. You know, I, I thought I wanted to anchor the news, but pretty much in order to anchor, a lot of times you had to be a reporter. And I was already in, in while interning, I was getting top stories in Louisville and Lexington because I went to Kentucky. But um, it wasn't fun at all because it was a car accident where somebody was killed. It was a fire where there you know, was fatalities. And I thought, this is not what I want to do. I don't care if I get the top story. That It did not matter at all. It just wasn't fun. So I knew things would start happening. I fell into a radio show uh, before I graduated UK, and I was in broadcast radio. Uh, before I graduated, I was doing some television with Good Samaritan Hospital in-house, um, making, I think it was 60 bucks an hour. I mean, how cool is that where you're going, oh, I'm making 60 bucks an hour my first gig? Uh, you, you get to work two hours, but hey, that's like one of the coolest things ever. So I was doing what I was doing immediately and uh, doing some film, working on real films, CBS miniseries. Uh, when the Brat Pack was around, I was working on some of that. And, uh, you know, I was doing exactly everything I wanted to do. Um, but then along the way, you know, I was doing sports and Disney and all these different things. Uh, it was great. It was fun. But at one point, you know, you want to take your passion and mix it up with your career. And uh, that's mm -hmm. when I started at least kind of letting it out that that's what I wanted to do. Because I was always taught by agents that, you know, you're, you're selling product on uh, HSN or QVC or infomercials, or you're, you're on this uh, network or, uh, you know, whatever, whatever the show was. And they would say, if you start talking about Bigfoot, if you start talking about ETs and you start talking about UFOs, no one's going to believe you anymore. They're not going to buy a product from mm. you and you're not going to have any work. And I, I tell you, I held on to that for a long time and struggled with it because I wanted to talk about my passion. And it would come out because, you know, if people asked me about it, I would talk about it. Um, I didn't have that filter of, oh, I shouldn't do it, which maybe I should have in some circumstances. But, um, you know, I just at one point said, this is what I want to do. And I would stop holding back because I did find myself holding back and that it wasn't working on either side at that point. You got to you got to be free, you know. So uh, mm -hmm. here I am. And it, it is true. The paranormal world, there is no money in it. Uh, so <laughs> it is a survival <laughs> It is a passion for sure, but uh, um, but it is a passion. And if that is something in your blood, you want to know the answers. You want to know the truth, and you want to be be around other people that you can speak openly about it. And and you know maybe try to figure it out. Yeah, that's. I think that's as much as we can ever hope for. And you know, certainly in the UFO field, that's um, all I really hope for is just um, trying to look at look for the answers. Yeah, And also speaking to some very intelligent, interesting people with good points of view. That's been um, a fascination, and and I really enjoy doing that. And the listener, we are on with Connie Willis, and if you'd like to jump in the chat room, um, it's very easy. If you're listening, you're live, you're listening right on the same website, just two clicks and you're in. And also, if anyone would like to call in, we tried the number, and it is working. For some reason, now it's working. So you're welcome to call Yay. in at 603-967-4030. And so, Connie, you have hosted uh, Coast to Coast a few times, and we had a question come in because I, I think it was back in February. You had a guest on that was talking about the Montauk uh, project, so mm -hmm. the question came in, a question came in from Kelly. She wanted to know if you've ever personally researched that. Well, absolutely. You know, just, uh, you know, more so just because of preparation for the show, uh, talking with Preston Nichols and Christopher Garantano and, 
I always slaughter his name. He's a great guy. He's just like, hey, Christopher, you know, where would that name come from? But he's a wonderful guy, by the way. He did a documentary on the Montauk project and did a really, really good job. And so, you know, when when that when he was ready with it, I'd been talking to him for a couple of years. And finally, you know, he was to a point to, to go on air with it. So we went on air with it. And before that, too, I uh, learned all I could about Preston Nichols. Uh, being a part of the Montauk project and um, <laughs> one of my craziest shows ever. Uh, yeah, I've been with Coast for over, I guess, a year and a half now, and that was probably one of my most memorable. In fact, it it was on Valentine's night uh, because some of the things he said, I remember it was uh, almost a year ago coming up here soon. But the Montauk project was, I mean, just <sighs> – the, the the crazy thing about it is a lot of people can relate to it. A lot of people talk about it. Uh, they enjoy the story of it. Uh, they try to pull things together and look for the evidence. Uh, but another thing is a, a lot of people say there's absolutely no evidence except yeah. for these people's story. I've and, heard that. Uh, Do yeah. you want to go, yeah. go over what what uh, that is supposedly happened? Um, well, it's kind of a mixture of a whole lot of things. You know, ET's involved, government's involved, there's conspiracy, there's uh, young boys were raped, um, uh, things were, you could sit in a chair and you could uh, manifest something to come alive. And in fact, at one point, a giant Bigfoot came alive. And in some stories, you heard it was 30 foot tall. In other stories, you heard it was 10 foot tall. I mean, it had so many different things. In fact, the Montauk Project, you should get that as the latest documentary because it really is good and it really shows you the fear and what these guys are going through. The more interesting thing to me about the story, and I think even with this question that you had, um, was the fact that year, within the past uh, several years before I even did that show, I had met a lot of guys a, little, a lot of kids between 18 to 24, uh, boys, young men, um, that called themselves super soldiers, and they basically were describing that. And they called themselves super soldiers. What they say is they would fall asleep, and that's when they would be taken, and they would be taught basically superhero-type things, or those they already had the abilities, but it would be turned off and on, and they would... Um, like let's say one kid would would fall asleep, and they would they would take him ET or or government. They they said different things different times. Each person kind of said something different. They were all trying to figure it out, but they would be taken, and they would be taken either somewhere on our planet, somewhere on our planet in the future or maybe past, or some other planet, and they would be. Um, their abilities would be turned on, whatever their abilities might be, and they all had different ones, and some were better than others. And they would have them basically train for some sort of fight or some sort of military event. Some of these guys would say that they were on some other planet or wherever they might be, and they might fight a dinosaur. They might fight, you know, Goliath. And then they would... Uh, they they exhaust themselves, then they would take them back, they'd be in bed, next thing you know, these guys would wake up, and they would have marks all over their bodies. They would no longer have any abilities, it was just turned off like a switch, and they're called super soldiers. And it really, you know, sounded like the Montauk Project, and all the guys that are considered super soldiers, they will, be, they will talk to you about the Montauk Project as well, they believe it's still going on, now, and they believe a they're a part of it. Is this like all repressed memories? Um, some people can just bring it up as if it just happened. Hmm. Some people um, have done some hypnosis, but I think for the most part, most of these guys remembered a lot of it. And that was the scarier thing for them as well, because they, they were like, I'm not even forgetting this. And I'm waking up and I'm seeing, you know, I, I was fighting a dinosaur and that thing nailed me with the tail right across the face. And I looked in the mirror and I got a slash across my face. So it's really interesting. It's really intriguing. But but I got to tell you, too, I mean, you might go, oh, it's it's these kids. They're playing these video games. They're falling asleep with it uh, mm -hmm. in their head. And, and they've been playing too many hours. A lot of people want to say that. However, these kids, they're 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 very intelligent. Um, they're frightened. 
as well. They're not happy about it in any way, shape, or form. They they kind of uh, stick to each other uh, and and even individually. You know, they're kind of. Um, I, I, just the ones I've talked to now. It, maybe there's some others not. So if they're listening, I don't want them to think, well, we're, we're not all introverts. But uh, just talking with them, they do have slight, you know, they have abilities that I think are extremely strong, but they say it's nothing to what they have when they're taken. Um, but I've seen some unbelievable um, uh, psychic abilities from them just saying that you know, they're not really given much of anything of what they really can do. It's really a scary thing. Um, and is it still going on? I don't know. I mean, you know, you talk about 411 and, um, mm -hmm. you know, the David, uh, David Pauly's always say, right. Pauly's Pauly, you know what I'm saying? Yes. I slaughter his name as well. Um, sorry guys. Um, he's got, you know, kids being taken and people being taken and then they're dropped back down, you know, because it seems like they've been lifted up and then they drop back down somewhere else. You that know, is, so who knows? I love listening <laughs> to those stories. It's yeah, amazing. So maybe that stuff is still going on. You know, yeah. people don't talk about that kind of thing. Now, it was remote remote viewing was actually, you know, part of the government. It's, you know, I mean, that, yeah. was, that stopped, I think, in the 70s, if I remember right. So this is almost like a spin off of this a little bit. Yeah, I guess um, you know, I uh I've been blessed to be able to uh say I'm a student of Lynn Buchanan's and he was one of the psychic spies and uh getting to know and also interviewed um Joe McMonicle and you got Paul Smith and you know it goes on and on with these guys. They're they're great. They were all the psychic spies and the ones that are still alive and around and they're just unbelievably intelligent and they have a lot to teach and they love it. It's in their blood. If you ever get to take any classes or courses with any of them, do. Um definitely do that, but uh, you know they that was a secret in the military. Um and then, you know, for 20 years, and they say it didn't work, well, okay, well, if if something doesn't work uh, and you're trying for 20 years, well, my gosh, you gave it your best try. But, but you know, you ask them, hey, do you think this stuff is still going on now, or is it is it even, you know, way more advanced than what you guys have done? You know, they either can't say, or, you know, they know and they can't say, or they don't know. Uh, because they're retired, I, I don't know. I can't imagine some of the best minds. They not, you know, they're not calling on them unless there's people better. Uh, but I can't imagine that this stuff is still not going on. Whatever it is that is going on, I think the Montauk project uh, was also funded by possibly, you know, these are all stories. Who knows? Mm -hmm. um, but I think they said it was funded by somebody else outside. I think some people have said it was government. Some people said it was ET. Uh, it was a combination of them, but it was also some private uh, funding. So at that point, it can be all different, you know, than just plain straight out the government, like uh, the psychic spies and uh, Project Stargate, which is what you were talking about. Um, yeah, I think how could you not? If you've got a psychic spy and, and you have learned how to tap in psychically, you got to keep doing that, right? Why would you stop that? Right. Um, now, there's a question up on the message board. Can you give any examples of successful remote viewing targets? From, like, people uh, I know? or um, Just in any examples. It's a question on the message board. So it's uh, sort of vague. Are you familiar with any um, re remote viewing targets that... Uh, were successful. Hmm. Well, I mean, all probably all secondhand stories like I've heard. I mean, yeah. But you not well, personally. yeah. Well, you know what? Um, you know, I've heard a, a lot of them too. And and sitting in class with Lynn Buchanan and talking with these guys, all these different remote viewers, and reading books um, from these guys, um, Ingo Swan. I mean, the best of the best. Um, well, yeah, absolutely, or they wouldn't continue it on. Um, I, I misread that McMonagle. question. Now, now, the person okay. was asking if you ever had any remote oh. viewing yourself. 
Oh, I've, I've, I've done it. I'm an advanced uh, remote viewer. However, if you know anything about remote viewing, it is almost like chess. It's martial art of the mind. And you have to constantly practice it and practice it and practice it. It is uh, not just something you sit there with your mind and you're a psychic. It's, it's very different from that. You actually have pen and paper and you are drawing or you can use clay to make, you know, what you're seeing 3D. It's really, really artistic, fun, intelligent. It's an incredible thing to please learn if you're into that. Take advantage of this while people are still alive to teach you the real McCoy and nothing outside of the military, even though some of them do differentiate a little bit from the shortcuts that they've learned, still do it from the guys that, that were doing it or the people derivative of it, like uh, Lori Williams is incredible um, as well in teaching that. But yeah, I've, I've remote viewed and, uh, you know, we can all do it. And I remember one of my, one of my targets, um, you know, you don't know what your target is. Basically, they're, you know, when you're learning how to do it, they take pictures that they've cut out of random magazines and they put them in envelopes and they stack a hundred envelopes and uh, you count down, you pick a number, number between one and a hundred and, you know, like 33, and then they say top or bottom. So then you count down, you know, 33 three from the top or bottom, whichever you choose. And then they take that uh, envelope and set it aside and that's your target. So you don't, you don't know what that is. They don't know what it is. It's just there, you know, it's blind for everybody. And you just start uh, doing the protocol of what you're taught of how to do it. And, and uh, you're something, your, your soul, your conscious, your subconscious, your, you know, something goes to that area and you can start describing it. You, you feel the temperature you, and, and you're taught, to realize what the ambiance is, you know, you, you have to be taught to stop, smell, feel, taste, you know, you're taught to use your senses once you're over there. There was a time I was in Finland and like, I think it was like 17 something in the 1700s or something. I was, I, I was actually next to this like church setting and there was a fence, and there were people outside of it, and there was like this little kind of ditch area, and it was snowy, cold. And, um, you know, all I knew was I was just learning how to do it, and I just kept seeing like this like kind of fence post, and I kept drawing it, and, and it was cold, and I was in a shadow. And, and then finally, you know, I saw this church and the steeple and the, and the cross on top of it, and you're drawing all this stuff too, and when when i looked at the uh picture uh after i was done it took me about 45 minutes or so and I, again i was learning this was basic 101 course um when when i was done and kind of exhausted of you know this is let me see how i've done and i saw the picture i could tell you exactly where i stood or my whatever my subconscious or whatever piece of me was there, I could tell you exactly where it was, exactly where it was. It mm. was unreal. It'll it'll change your life uh, to do it. I mean, it's uh, I I was on Easter Island. Um, I saw Easter Island. Whether I ever get to go there physically or not, I've been there. <laughs> so yeah. it's pretty neat. It's really cool to do. I hope you get a chance to do it. Well, I it's funny. I was on. I don't know if you've ever heard of Mac Maloney. He does a show on UFOs, a lot of military involved in his shows, uh, does a weekly one. And he asked me on one time, so I was on with him, and Jesse sprung this on. It was live. He sprung on me. All of a sudden, he says, okay, I have something right in front of me on my desk right now. You need to remote view and tell me what it uh, is. Uh, <laughs> so I uh. just said a second. I said, <laughs> I said, it looks like a turtle. And he said, you got it. It's a hard hat. <laughs> no, that's, that's as close as good. I've ever done. That's pretty good. Have you remote viewed? Have you learned it? No, no, I've oh, never, okay. never even thought of it. But uh, oh, um, you yeah. know, he just did that kind of as a for fun, you know, type of thing. Well, I think remember, you... remember men who stare at goats. Oh yes, yeah. Okay, when they were when they were um, when they were putting that together, um, it was in, it was in. Miami, they were doing a lot of stuff, or, or at least some casting. And I remember I was in Florida at the time living, and I was calling a, 
calling them up going, hey, I'm, I'm a remote viewer, you know, being in film and TV, that's what you do, right? You always have to audition and always <laughs> tell them, hey, 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 I, I do all this stuff. And they were like, oh, you're a remote viewer. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and of course, not realizing, you know, these are just casting directors. They know really nothing about it. They think it's a psychic thing, which it is not psychic, you know, to that extent, extent that people think at all. And she was like, oh, well, then tell me what's in my hand right now. And I was just like, oh, I just want to go choke her because it's a protocol. You know, you have to set down a piece of paper and pencil and you start doing phases. And so it's just so very different that, you know, kind of irks any, any remote viewer when people think it's psychic it is but it's not you know Mm -hmm. now this show of course is about ufos so we have to touch on the subject at least in the first hour a little bit have you (laughs) ever uh, looked into that topic and have you ever had a sighting yourself yeah yeah i've seen i've seen um i've seen some pretty cool things um and all over um i've seen things in kentucky before um, seen a lot of things off the coast of uh, Florida when I lived there off of Sarasota, off Longboat Key. Mm. I would sit out there at nights and just look out in the Gulf. And you would think you, you might not see, I don't know, maybe not see that much. But but I saw a whole lot of things and very, very interesting things. There was one time where, um, you know, it just something said, look up. And, and I looked up and I looked right right where you know something caught my eye and and i i heard i heard this it's not voices in my head most of the people that are, you listen to your show i'm sure understand getting messages of some sort where you're not sure where it comes from but i uh, heard something say look it looks like a it looks like a star and i looked and i was like oh that looks like a star and mm-hmm. and then it started moving and um then something behind it was kind of, or beside it, I guess, was, uh, it started, it started moving, then something kind of started following it, another light. And it kind of made like this gigantic horseshoe, uh, kind of shape in the sky. And this thing was following it. It was not hooked on to it. It was not another piece of it. This thing was following it. And it, it appeared to me to be in like, um, it just way, 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 way out there, not in our atmosphere, but way out there. And then it got to a point and it just stopped. And so did the one that was following it. And it just shot out into outer space real fast. It was unreal. Wow. And, and, and somebody else saw it with me. So it was great that someone, we just watched that going, holy cow, that was great. <laughs> was this way off in the distance? It was way, way up in the sky. I mean, uh, it looked like a star. Uh, It was definitely, yeah, it was way up there. It was outside of our atmosphere. However, then it went out into outer space, I mean, after that. Does that make sense? Yeah. um, It was not something close by. It wasn't like a plane or helicopter or anything around here. You know, the the thing, uh, this is just occurring to me while we're talking about this is, you know, I imagine that there's all types of detection out there and there's so many people talking about seeing things coming through or up in the upper atmosphere. So these things must be detected. I can't imagine that they're not. Well, here's another interesting thing. I called my brother at the time the next day and I said, oh my gosh, you wouldn't believe what I saw. Now, the brother that I called uh, happened to be in the Air Force at one point, and now he's you know, a pilot for UPS. So, so he's always up in the sky, and uh, an ex Air Force dude. And I'm like, uh, and by the way, he lives at the bottom of South Mountain. He moved there a year after the Phoenix Lights. I'm like, oh, you have no idea where you are. <laughs> it's like that's so cool. Why didn't you move here a year before? <laughs> Maybe I would have been there for the event. But uh, uh, I told him about it. I said, um, you know, told him about the lights and what they did. And I, I wrote different things down. I have it somewhere written out. It was like June 6th uh, that it happened and maybe 2006 or 2010. But anyway, I wrote it down and he said, ah, oh, he said, let me let me let me ask you, uh, did was there anything in the news about, you know, something happening with a space shuttle or some something out there? And I was like, 
I, I don't I don't know. And, and he said, well, go get a USA Today. Go get some sort of national paper. He said, USA. He goes, well, I, I got a USA Today in front of me. And he, he opens it up, and here's this little paragraph. And he said, let me just tell you something to look for whenever you find something or whenever you see something in the sky. He said, I want you to look in some sort of national paper, and I want you to look to see if there's anything in it that refers to what you've seen. And he, he pulled something up, and there was a little paragraph, absolutely. Last night, um, uh, I think it was one of the satellites connected with another one, or it might have been the space station, something connected with something else. And he said, is that what you saw? And I said, well, no, nothing connected at all. Something followed something else, but nothing connected. And he said, well, this clearly says it's something connected. He said, I just want you to know that whenever you see something, see if there's not something that can kind of debunk you a little bit and just be like, no, well, maybe you just got it wrong because here's what happened. I found that interesting from my brother who was in the Air Force, you know, retired. Hmm. Wow. To, to tell me, hey, yeah. here's, you know, why don't you notice this in the future, that there's always going to be something to kind of, you know, kind of just play it off a little bit. I, I found that very interesting that it was actually in the paper something was, there was a blurb. But no, that is not what I saw. And that's just, you know, I've seen other things, too, up in the sky. There's so many uh, things. If you just look, if you just look, you'll see stuff. And um, I was very lucky uh, very blessed to be apparently the only person is um, how it was touted, and, and I was happy about that, to stay at Jesse Marcel Jr.'s ranch interviewing him for like four days. Really? It was it was a blast. He's a, He was so, so nice, such a kind guy, and his he family like was it. still out there. He was. He was great. Very and quiet man. He – it was amazing that he actually – would, you know, being a medical doctor and part of the service and all that, that he would actually risk it all, so to speak, and really say exactly what what he saw, you know? Yeah. And he never changed his tune. And never. one of the things he had said, yeah, he said, look, you know, he said, uh, you know, I was like, what what bothers you the most about this? Or what is it that, uh, what are the pros and cons of, of knowing this? And he said, well, the worst thing is, he says, that everybody wants me to add on to my story. He said, what, how much more can I add on? I told him the truth. This is all I, this is all I knew. <laughs> he said, this is all that I was a part of. And he said, I'll never be able to change my story because it's the truth. But he, right. you know, he did have a lot of really cool things occur uh, because of that. You know, he he, um, I remember him telling me one of the things that he did, he, he did it, that he would have never, obviously nobody would have cared to have done this any other time if he had no, uh, uh, insight on this. But he said one time, uh, a man, and it wasn't the NSA, it was something else. It wasn't NSA, it wasn't CIA, but somebody in one of the defense, um, departments had, uh, snagged him in D.C., <laughs> and uh, I don't I don't know where he first snagged him. I don't know if he was there for some sort of meeting or, or what. But uh, the guy said, hey, can I talk to you privately about some stuff? He was like, sure. So he took him down. He said, I went into this elevator, Connie, and we went down, 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 down. Mm. He said, I don't know where we went. He said, but when, when we got off, we went into this room. And he, uh, he described the room, too. He remembered everything pretty well. Uh, but he said... The guy just sat there and he looked right at him and, and he asked, you know, what else do you know? You know, we can talk now. What else do you know? <laughs> and he was mm -hmm. like, I don't know anything else. That's all I know. And the guy said, well, he said that's a pretty much uh, he, he confirmed it in some way to him that right. uh, he did confirm that. Yeah, he confirmed it to him, but he didn't go into anything else. But he wanted to know if Jesse knew anything else. Isn't that something? Wow. Mm hmm. I got to speak to his son a couple of times, but I never could connect with him when, since I've had this show. And he told me that, you know, it was really fun growing up, you know, hearing the story young from his grandfather and talking about it with his father. And also that um, um, his father, uh, Jesse Marcel Jr., built a uh, – he put this telescope up in a little observatory right in their backyard. I mean, he was really, really into 
um, astronomy and all that, everything, this whole thing changes life totally. Absolutely. And you're talking about Jesse Marcel the third. Yeah, I spoke with Jesse Marcel the Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know Jesse very well. (laughs) Yeah, he is. He's a nice guy. Yeah. um, uh, One of the neat things he said was, uh, you know, because you're like, gosh, did anything ever happen again to you, Jesse? Mm. And this is Junior. And he was like, he said, well, one time, and I guess he was, he was, he was like way out over some Iraqi desert or somewhere uh, far away. I, I cannot remember exactly where he was but he was on uh he was actually with in military duty when this happened uh and he said he was up in some helicopter and he said they had all their lights off and you know they're kind of incognito flying through the dark dark sky and he said he saw a light and uh he believed that was something different he said it really stuck out he said i can't say for sure but he said i think it was something uh, that was different Hmm. So he said that was his only other time. His only other time. I was just going to ask you if there were any other. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I was glad to have asked him that and that he had an answer. <laughs> right. Right. You never know. But he was a really nice guy. Very quiet. Yeah. And all the Marcells, they they were always very kind people. Right. Right. And, you know, the story of him, you know, seeing the, you know, I, I know, I think, I believe he was 10 years old or something like that. 11. 11. And. Up, oh, we have a caller coming in, and you know what? It's not working. We tested earlier oh. today. Caller, I'm so sorry. Um, and you're a whiz, Martin. You're so good and, with this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> we tested it earlier, and it worked. And for some reason, it's just not working. And I'm trying to figure out what what we did different. Sorry, caller. Um, if you <laughs> are still listening live, um, so that's it. We're not going to able. See, I can take this call, but it would put you on hold and. I could hang up by accident and all that, and I'm not, I can't do it. So, anyway. Um, so, if you happen to be... Uh, all right. I see who it is in the chat room, so we'll go from there. Okay. Uh, all right. Moving on. Um, <clears throat> Kentucky is a place... Now, you live there currently, right? Yes, uh huh. I'm here and helping my mom, who's uh, doing quite well in her rehabilitation after beating cancer. Yay! She's wow. she's doing great. Excellent. Seventy nine and strong, strong Willis. <laughs> right, right. Uh, one of the <laughs> most amazing sightings I ever heard happened right in Kentucky. Uh, how does that state rate, as far as you know, as as far as sightings go? Well, you know, it's funny. I mean. Um, you know, you just Google and then all of a sudden, you know, what, sometimes before I go on the coast, I'll see what has happened recently or something I don't know about. And, and I'll, I'll see all these, uh, <laughs> new things that happen in Kentucky. You know, we got the Bigfoot, we've got UFOs and of course, you know, the Kelly incident and, um, oh, yeah, where the, Kelly the incident. little, yeah, yeah, that's cool. That's, that's cool. I went and, uh, interviewed, um, oh gosh, I'm so horrible at names. I love her to death. Um. She's now pretty much the spokesperson for her granddad and uh, tells about the stories. I actually went out there where it happened, and uh, that's some scary stuff. Those things that happened in what, Kentucky. I want to talk was- about this because um, I have tried to get someone on the show that had investigated that previously, and mm-hmm. I was working with someone trying to get you know um, get a hold of someone that had to do. So that was. The Kelly Hopkinsville encounter. Yes, uh, yep. And do you can you just give to the listening audience? It's such an amazing, interesting, scary case. Can you give the in- encounter? Well, um, I'm still thinking of the daughter's name. She's going to kill me. She's going to go. God, I can't believe you did that to me. Um, and I love her to death. She's so sweet. You know, Kentucky people. They're all we're nobody's a stranger. Um, basically, um, you know, these little green men but i don't think they were green i think they were actually silver you everybody has seen a picture of these somewhere because it's iconic look they're they're not the regular gray looking creatures they're these little bitty creatures though that just uh showed up at these people's door and window and they were looking in for the most part um 
they saw lights and where something probably landed, you know, uh, and, and they did even the next day. But these little creatures were up on their front porch and they were looking in the window. And this was uh, in this little home in Kentucky. And I guess there were, I don't know, um, I think it was husband and wife and, and kids. And uh, right. as Kentuckians, hey, they pulling out the shotguns going, I don't know what you are, but we're going to take you out. You're not going to take our family out. Not knowing anything of what they were, what was going on, but they actually fired at these things. And um, when they shot them, the bullets didn't, it might have knocked them down or it might have, you know, made them nudge or move, but they came right back up. No big deal. They were up on the roof and uh, uh, everything. They they certainly couldn't stop them, and they were scared to death and just, uh, you know, finally ended up getting through the night. And uh, uh, it never happened again, but they didn't know what it was. Yeah. that They is... just saw little men, you know. They didn't know what to do. Yeah. I remember, I don't know if there was, they've ever done a documentary on that or not, but uh... – but it's just just an amazing case, and I'm trying to remember when this was. It was quite a while ago. Was it in the fifties? Yeah, it was like yeah, it was in the fifties that it happened. Um, golly, I should have that printed oh, up. I've is. done stories okay, myself on it. Nineteen fifty-five. Oh, you're pulling it up. Yeah, cool. Mm-hmm. There you go. There you go. Yeah. yeah um, oh, they they have like a little festival there and stuff. Um, really? And yeah, yeah. And I think they were silver, and they had just a distinctive look. It it wasn't like any. Uh, it wasn't like a little gray that you, you know you might be used to. It's not like a re- reptilian. It was these little bitty. You know, kind of. In fact, it, they have been described as cute. And where, like, the lady of the house was going, no, no, don't shoot, don't shoot, where, you know, the husband, it was the father of everyone, was going, no, I don't know what these things are going to do. But they were like, no, they're cute. Maybe they're not here to harm us. No, I'm going to shoot them. I don't know what they're going to do. I'm not going to give them a chance to hurt us. So, I don't know. They just kept coming up to the house and looking through the window and on the roof. It was just crazy. And, of course, after that, you know, the police were all like, well, it's just, a, you know, they're all drunk and doing moonshine. You know, they really, really made fun of it uh, or these they were they were clearly scared out of their mind. Right. Yeah. That's what I remember I mean, hearing about. it. Now, yeah. are, are there any other major cases that you're aware of? UFO In encounters? Kentucky. Or- uh, in Kentucky, I know there are. I know there's quite a bit of them. Um, um, but that's like, to me, that's one of the biggest ones. And yeah, there's a whole bunch of other ones. I can't even think of them right now. I should have. I should have studied up. I was. I'm so used to everybody asking me about Bigfoot lately. Well, let's um, go there. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! And the, yeah. and that's what I've been looking for here too. Yeah, I'm getting set up with uh, Charlie Raymond, who's head of the BFRO here, and so uh, he's going to take me to some cool places. I'm hoping. Yes, I, I saw on your Facebook page you're out big footing. You had your big foot uh, outfit on and everything. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> I was, I was. Oh, that was that freaky face right where I saw one. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so yeah, is there? I, is there a lot of people actually? Um, I, I did mention in the beginning of the show that we are going to go off topic, so um, the diehard UFO person may not be real happy, but that's okay. Um, we'll be back to UFOs next week at the uh, UFO Congress out in Phoenix. So, um, what are the Bigfoot encounters out there? You know what? Um, I don't know that you're going off of uh, you know UFOs at okay. all. I really don't. I. I don't think you are. Um, it's funny because some people, you know how people can kind of pigeonhole you into a category. Myself, I, you know, I grew up in a haunted house, so I know the ghost thing and I, you know, know the demon thing and I know that, you know, all the spirits and different things like that and blah, blah, blah. Then, you know, from there being open to it because you have no choice, you know, when you're a kid, it's not like you can just back up and move. Um, when you've got something in your house lurking around, you know, you're on your own. <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's survival till, till till college, you know, for me, where I could finally sleep when I went into the dorm for the first night. I could finally sleep throughout the night without, you know, thinking someone was looking at me. Um, but that opens you up to so so many of the other things, you know, where I got opened up to the alien things and the UFO and, you know, hybrids and uh, that kind of thing. And David Jacobs, man, I love him to death. You know, um, we, we talked for a long, long time. Good friend. And learned a ton through him. But 
when I started working on something, uh, pulling in content, uh, paranormal documentaries into a site called Paranormal TV, and in doing that, I met some Bigfoot people, and through that, they introduced me to, hey, you want to go with us sometime? So I did, and uh, I never thought of it much before that, but right before that was happening, I was really learning a lot about, especially from David Jacobs, and before Bud Hopkins had passed and stuff, but really learning a lot about hybrids and, and the hybridization project and uh, just abductions, UFOs, just everything. You know, you kind of go from from UFO seeing lights in the sky to, you know, well, what's in it? You know, so you start going the other way of the ET and, and uh, the, the abductees and things like that. So you can see what, what, what they're up to. And when I went to, uh, to this location uh, where they believe there were like two tribes and, and you know, lots of uh, sightings and lots of activity, I was very lucky, first of all, to go to a place like that because a lot of people never see or experience anything. But when I got there, I was interviewing a whole bunch of people, you know, asking them questions and what's going on and what, what do you see? What do you hear? What, what's your story? Cause people would just, you know, we were camping out for four days and people would just stop by cause th- th- these people live in this area and they've heard it from their grandparents and their parents and, and they've seen things and experienced things themselves. But some of the people, when they talked about what they saw and what they heard, they also brought up lights in the sky, uh, you know, UFO things. And then they talked about something called mind speak, which uh, in the UFO world, in the ET world, is telepathy. You know, so I started seeing where things were like, oh, my gosh, you're, you guys are talking like abductees are talking. But you're talking about Bigfoot. And they're saying some similar things that side by side I was going, holy cow, you know, I want to put connect all the dots. And when I'm hearing this, I, I'm, I'm very surprised at what I'm hearing. And uh, there's men in black that are involved when it comes to Bigfoot. There's lights in the sky. There's strange lights in the woods. And then, you know, you see these big hairy beans and these things mind speak. And they're elusive. They're there, then they're not there. You know, you hear these things walking through the woods like elephants, just knocking things down and and stepping on branches and logs, and then they're cracking under their feet like we would twigs. And then all of a sudden, they're just gone, and you don't hear them run off or walk away or climb a tree. Uh, so a lot of things very similar to uh, to me. There's no doubt they exist. It's just what are they? Are they interdimensional? Are they extraterrestrial? Are they human? I mean, if they're human, they're way, 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 way advanced, without a doubt. Yeah, and, you know, there's accounts of people saying that they would shoot them or people who said they have shot them. And I can't imagine it's it's, it's, uh, they're just so, you know... I've never seen one. I'm never going to say I've I've seen one or anything like that. But if something looked human like to me, I, I just couldn't imagine shooting it. I know, I know. I can't even kill a little bug. I don't know some bugs I can, but for the most part, I, I take it outside, you know, and save it. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, I tell you. Well, that's where a lot of bigfooters they don't want um, to tell their spots because they don't want people to come in. Uh, you know, one of the reasons is they don't want people coming in trying to shoot them. Um, they also don't want to tell their spots because that's their spot. They, that's their, that's what they do. You know, they go and hunt. And you know, when when you say hunt as Bigfoot hunting, you know, you're just searching and looking. It's never, you know, with a gun. When when you hear people say that, or they say they're going Bigfoot, and um, they are. The the most astonishing thing to me, one of the most astonishing things to me that I realized with Bigfooters is that they have a relationship with these creatures. You've you don't heard hear, that, people feeding yeah. them and things like that. They give gifts, yeah, and gifts come back, and they, yeah, they set up stones a certain way, and the stones are moved around. But they have this, but there's a, a relationship. Like an abductee of, of, of ETs, they're going to say, you know, ah, oh, they're taking me in the middle of the night, just against my will, you know, they're scared. They're not going to be talking good things, though some people do. I, you know, some people, they're, they're fine with all that. But 
but they don't have this relationship like these Bigfooters. These like mountain guys, camping guys, you know, hiking guys, hunting guys. They are, you know, they're all American dudes, you know, and and they barely admit sometimes to loving a woman, uh, much less <laughs> they have this relationship with with the the Bigfoot, and it is where they want they have a connection of some sort, and they want it to be stronger. And the Bigfoot knows them, and they know the creature as well. And even if they don't always see each other or never see each other, there is something there that is not in any other type of paranormal or uh, strange anomaly type thing out there that I have seen so far. It's uh, just amazing. So how, how do you think this, whatever it is, can be so elusive? Well, that's why I think it's got to be some sort of interdimensional or extraterrestrial type thing. I don't know. I don't know what it is. But, I mean, I can tell you from experience that um, there there was a time that I, I believe there were two about 10 to 12 feet away. And so, some guy, I was over at the campfire with somebody else, and, you know, we were all, a whole bunch of people out, and some people were out, it was late at night, and uh, there were other people out Bigfoot in, in some other area, and, you know, we had a little campsite set up, and all these people had come by, and there were some tents where some kids were, and they claimed kids are great bait, <clears throat> that these things are very <laughs> curious with kids, so the kids were already put into bed in the tent, and it was a it was it was on the other side of their tents on the tree line that that's where these things were heard. And some guy, one of the fathers, said, hey, you guys, uh, and his kids were in that tent and some other kids were in another tent. I was always like, well, aren't you all afraid of your old kid? No, no, they've never heard our kids. They're just great bait, you know. Like, oh, okay. Um, it's Yeah, it's crazy. Chumming, but ch- chumming with the kids. <laughs> they're yeah. chumming with kids, exactly. Chumming with their children. Yeah. Um, there you go. And and the guy came over and he he was going to bed, you know, to to hang out with his son and do the little camping thing. And, and uh, he came back though to the campfire where myself and somebody else was, and said, um, "Hey, I, I'm hearing some growls," you know. And and we we're like, "Well, okay, all right," you know. So usually when somebody hears something, and by the time you get back over there, you know, it's gone. But um, we went over there and darned if you didn't. I heard my first growl. And wow. it was, it was deep. It was, it was like dark. I don't know if you can understand that, but it was like, it came from the deepest, darkest depth of some of the biggest lungs I've ever heard. This growl was scary. And I just, we all heard it and we all were like surprised because it was like 10, 12 feet away from us. Now it's dark. Um, they're at the tree line. We're over where the tent of where the kids are. And I was like, Oh my gosh. And I, I, I was, I heard, I heard it. And then a second one, there was a second growl and I was like, Oh my gosh. And then I realized there's no fence between us and them. This is not a zoo. Mm-hmm. <laughs> there is no window. There is nothing. There is something there. And it, it seemed like to me there were two. It seemed like there was one that had a bigger growl than the other. It seemed like just from my remote viewing teachings and uh, a lot of the things that you are taught to practice with remote viewing is something called ambiance is where you, you're always feeling what's around you. Uh, you. You know when somebody walks into the room, uh, uh, if they're behind you. So you start noticing things like that. So to me, it seemed like there were two of them. It seemed like one was squatted down and one was standing up. But even if there was one, even if there was one, or let's just say there wasn't even a Bigfoot over there or not, let's just say it was a wild boar or uh, let's say it was a bear or a wildcat or like, I'm sorry, uh, a UK wildcat. Uh, it was a bobcat or something like that, okay? Well, it growled twice, mm. and any other animal would have went toward us or clumsily walked around somewhere else if it was a bear, uh, but it just, it there was no other noise. It We definitely knew where it was. It was a big, you know, two big giant growls, one deeper 
and bigger than the other. And wow. I actually said, I'm going to shine my light over there. What am I thinking? I'm going to, I'm going to see this thing before it comes over here. <laughs> and, and I shined it and there was nothing there. There was nothing in the spot where it, this thing was heard, nothing. And it, it, believe me, there was a lot of foliage around. There's a lot of, you could not walk without somebody hearing you, especially something that size. So if it was some other animal, there's no way it could have been any other animal because you would hurt them. You would wow. hurt them walking away. Yeah. How'd you, how'd but, you sleep that uh, night? <laughs> it was, it was, <laughs> these people sleep on the ground. I don't know what they're thinking. I mean, wow. there's spiders everywhere and snakes and they're sleeping on the ground. I got to have, if I'm going Bigfoot and, you know, Hey, look, I don't need to go to the local hotel, but I do need to have something that is lifted off the ground. And I need to have something that is thick walled around me because these things are real and i don't want them getting as close as they've gotten to me in the past they, they, there's no doubt to me and i don't you know i'll take it to my grave these things are real i just want to i'd like to know what they are and i do believe that it could be something extraterrestrial they're they're highly advanced and you know that when you're around them you just know that you know when you're around them well wow. well that we're at the top of the hour So that's it for this part of the show. Thank you for listening. If you'd like to help us out and listen to the full show and all of the archives of past shows, all that's going to cost you is $2 a month or more. You can find that on podcastufo.com. Next week, we're going to be coming at you live from the Phoenix UFO Congress. We have a great round robin, and it's going to be a lot of fun, and I hope you listen in. So thanks so much, everyone, and uh, need to also thank our guest, as well as Peggy Shunning for managing the Facebook page, Alejandro Rojas for the news, and we'll see you here next week right here at Podcast UFO. You can always listen live for free.